Uh, welcome everyone, both online and in person. Uh, just a friendly reminder to people online, please mute yourself um, so that background noise on your end doesn't interfere with the presentation. Um, today, the seminar is on creating the smart mind of the future with private LTE. Uh, the main speaker is Orlando Erickson. He joined Newmont in 2020 as Senior Director of Infrastructure. In this role, Orlando is responsible for overseeing Newmont's global information and operation technology infrastructure, including hosting, networking, service delivery, and collaboration. Over the past two years, Orlando has led the migration of Newmont to the cloud, as well as the development of a robust network connectivity strategy. Current projects include leading the rollout of Newmont's private LTE and the move to the cloud for Newmont's global operations. Uh, before Orlando, uh, Kirsten Sim Smith from Ericsson will present a few slides um, as a lead in. Uh, additionally, I just want to make an announcement that next week, um, Professor Rastami will be answering questions at the beginning with regard to seminar changes. Um, so be sure to be here for the beginning of that if you do have questions. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to you, Kirsten. Okay, great. Let me uh, go ahead and share my, my screen. Um, can um, can you see my screen? Are you able to see my, sc my screen? Okay, let me let me try that again. It work. Let's see here. Anything yet? All right, let me let me try this again here. Okay, no, it should it should come up now. So we see you. We um, see you. Okay. How there about you. there goes? Yep, it's in um, PowerPoint view as opposed to like presentation view, but it'll work like this. Okay. Um, so um, thank you very much. Um, my name is Kirsten Simsmith, um, and I head up mining for North America uh, at Ericsson. And just wanted to say a few words before I hand it over to um, Orlando. Um, so let's start by. Sorry, I'm trying to go to my next slide. Um, Basically, I, I just wanted to j just mention that, you know, the next generation of technology um, is shaping the decade to include these five um, technologies. Um, you'll, you'll hear in Orlando's presentation a lot about uh, wireless connectivity, um, but basically edge computing is, is really key. Um, it's going to allow for a, a number of mission critical applications that'll be very key. Um, to, to moving mining to uh, meet greater needs. Um, 4G and 5G connectivity is, is really important to allow critical IoT performance. In fact, 5G is, is gonna be key for um, helping with massive, uh, massive IoT. Um, and, and AR and VR will also need cellular connectivity to stream uh, videos remotely. I also wanted to say just a little bit about 5G. I mean, currently in the mining industry, and you'll hear this from, from Orlando, we're seeing um, LTE networks being rolled out um, for mining and some of the benefits, but we also see uh, mines that are introducing LTE, um, looking to having an eye on, on upgrading to 5G. There's a lot of benefits um, for mission critical uh, services uh, focusing voice and data on uh, helping to prevent like uh, injuries and economic uh, impacts during disasters. So those are, those are key um, from 5G. And ultimately 5G is, is really positioned to deliver, to deliver on the requirements with the really, really low latency and, and very um, high uplink speeds of hundred megabits per second. And finally, just a, um, a comment, there are, there are a number of use cases that um, 
LT connectivity is um, allowing um, to, to help the mining industry. Um, it, it's uh, there, there's so many that are important. You know, the, the key ones though are, are really uh, around safety and ways to help productivity. Um, and, and ultimately for trying to achieve these, uh, um, these benefits and things, it, it's gonna take a large ecosystem of partners um, to, make, to, to make this successful. And it's everything from starting with the mines um, to connectivity uh, providers, application providers, device providers, uh, OEMs. Um, it, it really takes a, a, um, a, you know, you know, an army of, of folks to, to work well together. So that's all I wanted to say and like to hand it over to um, Orlando Erickson. Hey folks, hopefully you can see this uh, screen. You can see it. Okay, you can hear me well, that's good. Yeah. Uh, so so as, as you've just heard, uh, we in Newmont looked at technologies and uh, which is what we always do and selected uh, 5G and LTE and uh, are looking at a rollout on a global basis. So before we get into that conversation, um, I'm just going to kind of lead you a little bit more through who is Newmont, just so you get a perspective around it. So, so Newmont has actually been around for 1921. It's uh, founded on gold mining. It's in the S&P 500. We work in North America, South America, Australia, as well as Africa. As, as you look at it, though, Newmont is really recognized more about environmental, societal, and governance practices. You know, integrity is critical to success. And if you try to shortchange on any of those elements, you are not going to be successful for the long term. You may be successful for the short term, but it will not be there for the long term. So by having robust safety standards, execution, and technical proficiency, that's how you stay around for 100 plus years. So I think it's really key to understand that. So our focus though is on gold mining. We do have some other uh, metals that come out with the gold, but we really are focused on gold. So. Orlando, could I interrupt you? Um, yes, please. Could you hit the full screen button at the bottom of your PowerPoint? It didn't go, it's um, still showing us um, the editor mode. Really? Okay, let me, I'm actually in full screen on my own screen. So let me yeah, escape out. out and reshare. Let me stop sharing and uh, we'll redo it he's again. Wrong, maybe he's it's not okay, let me try to share again and then you just correct me if it's uh, if it's not working correctly. Can you see it now? Yeah. It's still in PowerPoint mode. It's still in PowerPoint mode because it's actually filled up my whole screen. <laughs> Let me escape back out. Um, let me stop sharing. Let me try this again because it, it's actually only... in, uh, full screen mode first and then go to zoom through the, um, the mini tab. Yeah, let's try that. Let me try that. I'll put it in full screen. And then I'll go through the, yeah, when I do that, um, I'm actually pretty good with technology, just so you know. <laughs> I believe you. I'm just gonna say and share the entire screen and then I'll swing across and we'll see if this gets us there. And if this, uh, and now I'm gonna bring it to full screen are you seeing it full screen now? Looks great. Thank you. Sorry about oh, that. Sure. No, no, that's fine. Um, the uh, as as you've heard before, the, I'm I'm familiar with WebEx, Teams, and Zoom, but not usually in presentation mode in Zoom. So, apologize for that. Um, and and when I'm presenting, I can't uh, see if there's any hands or questions. So I'll go through the slides, and then we can stop and ask questions, and I can revert back if there is something. But uh, anyway, so we've talked about this slide. Let me get you to the next one. So when you look at how do you select a technology, 
you know, one of our key elements on this was to ensure that we had full mine wide connectivity. And when you look at some of the past technologies, which were very, very effective at that point in time, they had some abilities, but they had limitations. And as technology matures and you start to look at an LTE 5G, it allows you to address many, many more issues simply. And so when you get to the worker safety, um, I've actually watched and saw where, where people are using um, in the hard hat uh, a SIM card that allows a user to be tracked throughout a mine site because they have LTE and 5G in there. But, you know, it's pretty novel kinds of things. Um, it allows you to also start to have video analytics on the go. And so, you know, if you go down to the local Best Buy store, you can actually buy glasses that are very, very available, a couple hundred dollars that have cameras on them. So you can actually tie that back in uh, through a device into your LTE environment, and you can actually stream live video from a user. Similarly, we do that same thing from an operational standpoint, where you can actually see what's going on all the time with teleoperations, where you're not actually there physically. Um, the other side is in the regulatory side, in our sustainability efforts. This is so much easier for us to get more data from more sources where before networks were constrained, you now have the ability and what we're doing is to literally take and put uh, sensors out in tailings dams and things of that sort to do the tracking of that data. And we can get it from just about any place on the mine site. And in our designs where we use an LTE and 5G, we literally light up the complete physical boundaries of our sites. Um, I'm gonna drop, I'll jump over to cost reductions. By doing this, we've had the, the Wi-Fi technologies in the past, which I'm sure you've seen a lot of uh, vendor products that run and help you run the mine. Uh, but the problem is you're always running around trying to do signal analysis and trying to find weak spots and then fixing it. In some places, we'll have two, two crews 24 hours a day run around, keep taking care of the Wi-Fi as the mine moves because the mines are living. I mean, they're not in a stagnant position. And if you look at most LTE 5G designs, they, they cover a nice wide area. If you've got a Wi-Fi, it's really good for that building. But just think if your building's moving all the time, well, that makes it hard to keep that Wi-Fi running. Whereas if you go to the 5G or LTE side, you can actually position around the totality of your site and get full coverage for the duration, not just for the point in time. It also lets us get into a lot more autonomous kinds of activities, whereas autonomous hauling, uh, teleoperations, et cetera. And then it's secure because this is on a private environment with no access from external parties. So everything in there is effectively like a control network. And then it allows you to really increase the, increase the longevity of the mines because you're, you're, you're actually reducing your operating costs. And then additionally, you get production efficiencies because the more you can automate, the more you can have full connectivity with no downtime, you really get your asset utilization up and increased and you start to work on your work streams and those processes to make sure they're most efficient and effective. I'll go to the next slide. So what does it look like? And, and this is pretty straightforward. You saw the slide that, uh, that Kristen shared, but it, it's very, very similar. What you start to get into is I, if you have full connectivity, what are my limits is really the question. And if you go buy a, a cell phone with a SIM card in it, you could put some sensor probes on it and you can start capturing all kinds of data. So your imagination is the only limit on what you can do once you've got this environment stood up and available. So you get into the autonomous halls, you get into monitoring, you get into open pit development uh, with, with drills and, and diggers, et cetera. And you can track your, your, your transportation. We've actually even, uh, are doing our pilots on underground as well. So we can do full geopositioning underground. We can uh, have something that runs and is in a passive environment that doesn't take a lot of effort to take care of anymore versus in the past, you, you would have to re-engineer. So when you look at it, it's really about what's the, what's the amount of effort to keep this running? And it's really low once you have it in place. Um, when you look at it, you, you do software updates like you do on your phone or anything else. But that's all well controlled and well managed. And you get into the, the point of really being able to put full coverage across the totality of your operations versus just having it in a spot demand. 
Uh, it allows you, you know, emergency calling. You're, you do not have a limit on what you can put on the load on this. And I think I saw it in the earlier slides. One of the most important things is in a private LT 5G, you know, it's different than a, a commercial or public provider. They're always worried about your download speeds. In this case, you're really worried about your upload speeds. You want to send a lot of data up and be able to process it and move with it. And that's why going with a private LTE 5G is, is really critical for you. So here's a quick summary of it. What's the challenges? Well, if you keep uh, running with a Wi-Fi network, which is viable, you end up being very reactive. Whenever connections drop, you lose, uh, lose access to vehicles. Vehicles in, a, in an autonomous mode, well, they shut down after about two to three seconds. So you, if you don't have coverage, you effectively freeze your operations. So it's really key to not be in a reactive mode. Also, you have limited capabilities with that. So you've got, uh, uh, as you add more and more automation, more capabilities out there, the current you know, basic Wi-Fi networks start to become impinged. And then as well as it's costly. Like I said, you got crews running around trying to make sure connectivity stays across the totality of the mine, which is the challenge. So when we looked at this and we, we vetted it out, the best answer, and it's actually doable, is a 5G LTE. I've also looked at the satellites, but you know, satellites passing overhead, you start to worry about your, your transitioning and what your downtimes and stuff like that. Whereas in an LTE 5G, you, it's solid, it's capable. And our goal here is to implement it across all of our mine sites in the next three years and an active project already underway. And so what do we get out of it? We get high-speed connectivity for both uploads and downloads, low latency, because we define the latency around this with the how we plug it all together. Get high performance. You can have high density. You can have three or four full videos going on in the same area, um, which in the past on a Wi-Fi, you would be constrained. Um, and we can have fit for purpose re, uh, round trip latency. So we know exactly how fast to keep everything going. We can run high, high, uh, high resolution video. It's controlled and it's low energy consumption. So when you put it all together, it really does address the business needs. And I would also say that, you know, part of the assessment was, is LTE 5G really ready for a mine? And our answer is yes. People maybe, you know, a few years ago or five years ago tried it, but they, they didn't have quite all the necessary understanding about how to make it operationalized. And we now have that. So high confidence, very, very capable, and it absolutely is a, a fit for purpose solution for us. So here's where we're at. Um, we've got some mines around the world, as I said before. We've got four underway right now. We'll be looking at adding a fifth one yet this year. Um, then you start to get into 2023 and we've got four more mines there again. And then we got uh, three more in 2024. So we're, we're, we're almost to the rinse and repeat stage of this. Uh, our first site uh, fully coming online is in Penasquito, Mexico. And um, there be a live in about three weeks. Um, we've got one down in Suriname, they'll be alive in August, and then uh, Ahafo North and CCNV here in the U.S. will all be alive by um, end of November of this year. So very, very doable and good project management uh, is how we execute this. So as I said before, when you're trying to address a, a challenge like high availability connectivity across the, the totality of a mine site, we had to go out and look at technologies. And as we looked at it, I said before, we, we, we you know, is there, is there a, you know, Wi-Fi 6 coming that's going to do it? Is there uh, satellites overhead that would give us uh, the connectivity and things of the sort? And we identified that 5G really was it. Then we went through this operation of selecting the right partners. And we've selected Ericsson and we selected CAT. And both of those are strong, capable partners. And we're jointly working together in a, a full-fledged solution. And so... As I said before, if you have the right parties together with the same uh, end goal, uh, it makes it a lot easier. So by selecting these folks, we, we really set it up to be successful. And then we, we pulled in a system integrator and did the design and build. And, and that is also critical. Now, once you get this stuff executed, you got to communicate and drive the uptake. And this is where your, your, your skill sets of interacting with the business and, and the miners and, and anyone who's gonna use it is communicate, communicate, communicate. 
as I had a, an old uh, manager before tell me, he said, you got to say it seven times, seven ways, and then you can ensure that you get the, the uptake. And, and in this case, we've got, a, we've got some really hungry folks at the mine that are just striving for this. They're excited about it. So um, it's, it's one of those that uh, uh, all, the, all the vectors are pointing in the right direction for success. So, and with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and we can open up for questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Orlando. Um, you're happy to feel, or I'm happy for you to field questions yourself. Uh, if you have any questions from the audience, you can chime in or type them in the chat. Uh, are there any questions from the room? I'll get us started. Um, is there any site specific concerns with implementation? You mentioned like going to the different sites. Is it pretty much, is it rinse repeat or is there different obstacles that each site has to go through when implementing 5G or LTE? Yeah, yeah. So, so if you look at the industry, most frequencies that you're gonna use are probably secured by some telecom provider. So your, your first course of action is to select the frequencies and work with in the country and the country's legal system to have those frequencies allocated for your use in the private LTE. So the challenge is on all your geographical areas, working with those frequency providers. And that has meant that I've you know, talked to the every telecom provider in each one of these countries and entities and secured those frequencies. And that usually takes between from start to finish three to six months. Um, but having the Newmont name and presence really helps significantly. So uh, without that, it would be, uh, it'd be an individual trying to convince some telecom provider to let you have the frequencies. Then the next stage, once you get your frequencies and you select which ones are, are open in that area, the rest of it becomes really rinse and repeat. You have to design uh, based on the mine and the mine's five-year life, how to, how to stand up the gear, the towers, the fiber, et cetera. And once you have that, the rest is, is pretty straightforward. Um, we have a question, or Colin Randall, I believe, uh, raised his hand. So you can chime in or type in the chat. And then we also have another question in the chat. But Colin Randall, you're first. Um, yeah, so um, I am the network manager at the School of Mines. And okay. we recently uh, finished a project putting some Wi-Fi in the Edgar mine up in Idaho Springs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering just sort of two things with the uh, 5G LTE, what, what kind of range are you getting from an antenna and, you know, just rough numbers, like, you know, how high are you putting that up? And then um, if you could comment specifically to the underground use, um, where you maybe got a lot more line of sight issues and um, and other things. Um, okay. To that point. Good. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Good. Good question. So, so if you're doing an open pit, um, what we do is they have the system integrator we selected has some proprietary algorithms they use to help validate the coverage. And and when I said frequencies. What I always try, what I do is I go for two frequencies. You go for a low band and a mid band frequency because your low band frequencies get you better around the corner. So like if you have a wall in a, in a, in a mine site, having that low band frequency gets you um, when the truck is coming up next to the wall that you still got coverage to them. And then your higher band in the mid band range and like 1800 uh, megahertz and stuff like that gets you the, the throughput. But you remember, Bandwidth, and, and I'm an electrical engineer, but your bandwidth is how wide is it? And your frequency is about how fast you can drive up and down that road. And so when you go to that low band, you want to you wanna have it a little bit wider so you can still get good capacity through it. And your high band, you got a very fast freeway. So that thing is, is, is zipping along. So you don't need quite as much width. But even in that case, doing dual bands and then dual antennas on a vehicle allows you to, to get rid of those issues that would have prevented you from having coverage on a, on a continuous basis, right? So that's on the, on the above ground. And so your, Howard, your tower heights, your trajectory down into the mind, et cetera, is really what you're, you're doing your design about. 
on a tailing, just kind of more of a lateral. But our goal is not to broadcast signal out of a mine, it's all in the mine itself. So blanket the mine, uh, leave the surrounding areas uh, free and clear of that signal uh, uh, coming to them. In the underground, so when we were selecting technologies, we looked really, really hard at what type of solutions. If you look at how um, some folks are doing it is you engineer a solution for underground and then it's called an active based system. So then you got to add more stuff. And then when the mind changes directions, you got to do something else. So when we were doing our analysis, we came up with what is a passive system. And effectively you have a, a repeater every two kilometers and it's a cabinet, just a cabinet, which is the basic repeater. And then every 50 meters, you have a, a, a coaxial cable. You put in a, a DB splitter with a little passive antenna. So there's no power requirements. And then you put the, put the next 50 meters on there and the next 50 meters, next 50 meters. So you have literally take and, and you get a two kilometer run with a passive system, which then says, I don't have to have electrical engineers down there. I don't need to send IT people down there. I don't need any of that. It's just screw it together, plug it in. And if you ever want to do problem diagnosis on it, you literally walk down and with your phone and oh, I lost the connection. That means that 50 meters of cable is broken. I need to replace that cable. And that's about all there is to it. So we were looking at keep it simple as, as much as possible, even in the underground. And that's, that's how you do it. Plus in the underground, you got to look at it. It's nothing but a big wave guide, right? You pump a signal down, you got a wave guide. That's just like a microwave. You're just shooting signal back and forth. So um, you could probably go a little bit farther in those runs if you wanted to. You could probably go to three kilometers by putting some boosters on the end of the end devices, but two kilometers is probably okay. So you know, that's, how you, that's how you address the underground. Thank you. We have a question from Gordon Fellows. I'm going to read it since it's in the chat. The question is, what is the resolution for positioning in the underground environment? And what is the spacing or positioning required plus or minus travel around curves? I think you did address this pretty well already. Um, if you'd like to go in more detail, you're welcome to. Well, I think uh, the only thing I'd add on that is, is everybody, you know, from a, everybody wants to be down to about a half a meter of geo positioning, maybe even less. One of the reasons why we looked at the passive system is I have standoff from, from the wall. So as long as I'm 50 meters from a wall, I don't have to have any cables, anything near the, the face of the, of the mine. And so I can have better standoff to actually still run automated equipment right at the face. So that's pretty handy. Now in geo positioning, what we're still, we're working through some of this. We've actually seen demos of it. It's very, very precise. I mean, it's you know half a meter within a, a foot or so. Um, and so, so it's really, really, I mean, granular. What we're trying to do though, is you've got a lot of the OEMs, or original equipment manufacturers who have their proprietary solutions out there and they, they're they trusted, they know them and they're both based on other technologies. So it's, it's an evolution on that conversation, but uh, the geo positioning, when you're, uh, you're at 50 meters, I can, and I got an antenna here and antenna here, I can tell you within that 50 meters where you're at with very, very good precision because I've got two signal points pointing right down on top of you. And the, the deviation, I'm probably about to that when I, uh, when I get that done from a signal processing standpoint. And once again, around corners, we actually just antenna 50 meters, antenna 50 meters. Thank you. Um, audience, any more questions? Online, if anyone wants to chime in. <clears throat> yes, um, go ahead. Uh, sorry if I missed it, but have you ever considered the um, RFID technology? The question is if you've used RFID technology or considered. Um, yeah, so, so two things. One is, um, so I've done, I've done this in the oil and gas industry before. And, and when I looked at RFID, what you really look for is um, low cost kinds of tracking of devices. And what you have to do is you have to have the RFID tag tied to a certain frequency, right? So, so that's how you make an RFID tag light up. So it, it's very, very doable. But in our case, we've already got powered vehicles down there, powered on everything. So running an RFID is, is more like you're tracking something that doesn't carry a power source. And I, I remember years ago, there was a, about a two cent small RFID chip that you could have that was would, it had a battery life of... Uh, a grain of rice that would last five years. So, I mean, that stuff is pretty straightforward, but it's just not 
it's not that critical for us in this in this business use case. But it's it's definitely doable. I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward. Any more audience questions? I'm happy to take whichever angles you might want to go on these questions. That's my background is is all this kind of stuff. How do you make how do you make automation work? How do you make technology work? It's fascinating because a lot of this is new to me personally, so I'm really enjoying it. Sarah, do you have your question? Yeah, I'm just curious how you determine the um, progression between Penasquito this year and then Boddington's next year. Um, I don't know if you could quite hear that. Um, yeah. How did you pick the progression of mines to implement the technology? What was the selection criteria and how did you come up with that order? So um, I don't know if you've seen in the press, but uh, um, let me step back a little bit. Penasquito was one we'd already started to work on about a year and a half ago. And so they were, they were trying to get local frequencies and they were further along in their thought processes on it. And so that's why they were, right at the front of the pack. When we, we then went to Marion, we had done a, a detailed assessment last year on Marion as a mine, and it's got long life, many uh, ore bodies out there. Um, and as we were putting in new networks and things of sort, we said, obviously we wanna make sure that we put this into that mine as well. And we were able to secure the frequencies relatively quickly. And so it just, it's naturally flowed. When you get to CCNV, you'll have seen the announcement between CAT and Newmont, where we're going to put in electrification of our fleet. And our pilot proof site on all that research is in CCNV. So that's why you see that coming. And in the Ahafo North, the reasoning around that was more so that it, that's a new build. It's brand new coming out of the ground this, this uh, latter part of the year. So start them off on the right foot right away. So you're investing for the future, not trying to do something to Kind of hold them over. The rest of the sites are, um, we, we have autonomous haulage already going on in Boddington. Um, we've got it on Wi-Fi and we recognize some of the challenges with that. So they just immediately said, okay, yeah, this works, let's go. Um, so once again, you do the frequencies, it takes about three to six months. Um, I think really what the gist of your question was, how do you strategically pick? And, and let, me, let me go a different way on that conversation. When you have, when you have a group of everything, and you're trying to figure out, you know, whether the organization is ready for it, whether you want to spend the money right away on that one. And the other side of it is, um, as as the uptake would come through, are they prepared for that uptake? And so as you go through those kind of questions, that helps you winnow down. And and the real irony of it is, is the first folks that we shared this idea with, uh, like, no, 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 I don't, I don't think I want to be at the front of the pack. Once we started moving down the, the track a little bit, what you had was, is everybody said, can I jump to the front of the line now? Um, and because the technology becomes more familiar and, it, and it's human nature, right? You, you hear about something new, like, yeah, let me, let me wait. I'm not gonna buy that next generation phone. I'm gonna go slower. And, and the same process goes here. And then you start to look at the value of the mine and which one can get the best value the quickest. And that's usually what drives any decision. How do you get the value of the fastest? Good question, though. It's, it's, it's more than technology. It really cuts across the board of everything. It seems like um, second adopters are typically the goal of the mining industry. Not to be the first adopter for technology, but the second adopter. Seems Our harsh. chief operating officer challenged us to say, I want to be the most connected mine in the world on all my mines. And his question to me was, uh, you know, I originally when I did this in November of uh, in November of 2020, 21. Now, yeah, his go, his, his, or 2020, his answer was, I said, five years. He said, how about two years? Maybe three. And uh, so his, his, his goal and our senior leadership is absolutely committed to get this done. This opens all kinds of high value opportunities for us. So with that senior leadership pushing us to really achieve higher value it, it really does line up and, and help point all the vectors in the same direction. Something that also stood out to me a lot was the, um, the safety components of this technology. Obviously, Newmont wants to be a leader, not just in productivity, but in safety. So that seems, this isn't really a question. It's more of just an observation that it's Newmont taking care of their people and their sites. Um, 
Do we have more questions from the audience? Yes. Um, if you talk loudly, the mics are throughout the room, so we yeah. will be able to hear you. The use of IG technology is a trend in all mining companies. And, and what is the next step of and, and technology <laughs> in, in doing the mining life cycle? After 5G or? Yeah, after 5G. So the question is, um, once all the mines are using 5G, what's the next stage of improvement? And I, are you happy with my restatement? But it's uh, all the mining companies are using a uh, 5G technology during the mining. Are you asking if all of them are? Yeah. Um, so is Newmont the leader right now on 5G? Do you know about other companies? Um, yeah. How ubiquitous is it in the industry? It is not ubiquitous. It, it, it is, we're in the early, early adopter stage. There's, there's a few here, a few there, but no one has said, let's globally go roll out 5G to all of our minds. And Newmont's, you know, years ahead. People are starting to talk about it now. We're already in the execution stage. Like I said, we've got one coming alive here in just three or four weeks and another one's two months behind. So, um, there, and there's, there's, there are, you know, folks will look for what we don't do right but um, I'm here to tell you, we will do it right. And we will be successful. And the, 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 other, the other side of this, I think, you know, folks just starting out in the industry. One of the things you should start to ask yourself is what data would I like to have that I've never had before? And uh, what you'll find is once we place this out there, the data, the data capabilities just trump human, humongously through, through your, your scope of thinking. Like, so part of this, and, I, and it started out in the, in this side was, I also do the hosting. So we've literally taken all of our mine sites, great connectivity to them into the cloud. So they all have their own cloud presence. Um, we've taken all IT off from a site and moved it all to the cloud. We're taking the OT to the cloud. So I'll have ability to have something in the cloud and something on the premises in case of a, a network failure. Uh, I don't want network failure. So I put in two or three connections to every mine site high speed, less than 100 milliseconds of latency. And when you do that, now you've got all that data that you're capturing on a site. I get your ideas going. I want more data, I want this, I want that. I'll put that up into a cloud presence with all kinds of analytics floating around for you. And, and you know, it's, it's more critical for you to learn to ask the next level of questions because the data is gonna be there. You're not gonna be struggling getting the data. Now you get to really try to figure out how to change operations and become more efficient, more effective, et cetera. So I think it's, I think, you know, Newmont's way ahead of the curve on it. Um, and, and it really positions us extremely well for doing that heavy analytics and, and further improvements in operations. Thank you. To tap onto what he just said, in, in terms of being a university student, should we really be focusing on our data analytics for our graduates? And the people coming into Should we be prioritizing data analytics then from a graduate student perspective and a graduate program? Is data analytics something that deserves a excessive or um, priority. priority for the mining department here at Mines and other similar departments? Is that yeah, something I would tell you yes. I tell you yes because when I when I dissect the problem, right? Because everybody always when we go to the university, we all learn how to solve problems, right? And that's what we, we crave. They're like puzzles and let's, let's solve the next problem. So once you have data, and I, I now know that I can get good quality data and I can look across my work process, I can now start to, to transform my work process because I now have data. But how do I interpret that data? How do I understand that? How do I know that you know um, a third order kind of element is actually causing a new outcome, right? If you don't do analytics on it, if you're not going to know that if I would have that butterfly flapping their wings around the world was causing the, the, you know, the hurricane on this side of the world, you don't know that unless you start trying to figure that stuff out. And um, when I've done analytics before, it, it's, it's amazing what you learn. Um, and, and in analytics, it's better to ask, what's the question I really should be asking about <clears throat> How do I improve? How do I do this? How do I do that? And then be ready to be surprised because you'll be you'd be shocked by some of the outcomes and some of the new ways of doing stuff. And I, I'll give you an example from an oil and gas standpoint. When they used to drill oil wells, 
um, you'd change out the bit, the drill that would would drill the hole in the ground. And you change it out about every seven days, eight days. And it'd take you about six weeks to two months to drill that well. Do you know where they're at today? They put the bit on at the top of the hole and 14 days later, they've already drilled the whole well. No changing out the bits, none of that stuff. So that's because you analyze the technology, you work it, you work it, you work it. And before long, an operation that took two months now is 14 days. That's the same thing that goes on is to ask questions and then see about what, what looks like the impossible becomes very doable as you get better understanding and better analytics around it. We have a question from Fati. I know it says I'm Fati, but um, he's, uh, his question is using 5G makes the flow of the data faster, which means more data needs to be processed, which requires advanced machines as well. Um, are you factoring that in? It looks like the whole mines technology structure is being upgraded. So can you mention the, if they're getting all this data, how are you processing all the data? Yeah. Great question. Great question. So when you when you think of like an autonomous haul fleet, right? If the trucks are all running themselves, you built an algorithm to how how they're all supposed to operate. And then they all have, um, you know, drive capabilities on them to make sure they don't run into somebody or something of the sort. So that whole vehicle by itself is already being upgraded, right? And now you're getting more data from there, which then you use in your analytics routines to better to find that algorithm, uh, how to be effective with those vehicles, right? And so, yes, the whole fleet gets upgraded, your technologies get upgraded, and oh, by the way, your downtime, your efficiencies improve, et cetera. So you literally are, are, are taking the mind from today to the future because you're starting to do this. And when you don't have, so, so think of it this way, if you had a dirt road you were driving on and then somebody paved it, think of the, drastic difference of how your experience was when you're on a dirt road versus on a, a paved road. You can go much faster. You can carry more loads. You can do more things. All those kinds of things are exactly the same as here. Um, you know, a, a vehicle that's designed to go off-road won't go as fast on the, on the highway, but on the highway, you've got more capabilities on there. You can do other things that you couldn't do someplace else. So yes, you, you do have to think about this is a step change for the whole when you're done. If we don't have any more questions, I wanna thank you once again. Um, great talk. Um, thank, thank you, you. Kirsten as well for um, suggesting this and Orlando for taking the time to present to us. Um, it really seems like a revolutionary change in how things are done. Um, and it's good to see Newmont taking the lead on this. Uh, as a reminder to everybody, the seminar will be available on YouTube, the recording. Um, so please check that out. Other than that, um, thank you again for presenting. And that's it for today. Thank you, folks. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, Orlando, for the presentation. Appreciate it.